Good morning. This is the second Sunday after Pentecost, June 14th, 2.20. And uh, this is the Solemn Assembly of the Holy Eucharist, in the Roman Catholic Church. Don't let that scare you. It's just part of the Christian year. And this is the Sunday that they emphasize the importance of the Lord's Supper. Um... Today I'm going to read all four of the texts from the lectionary. That's, of course, the, the new common lectionary that all the Protestants use. Um, it keeps us honest as preachers for two reasons. Number one, it takes care of, it takes care of, the, of the need to be forthright in your Bible study. You have to really stay on your toes. And after three years of that, and I've done it in this cycle since I was a young man, you cover 88% of the entire text of the Bible in that three-year period. So um, it's probably good for the people I preach to as well. But there's another reason that I want to do these, and, and that is it's... Um, well, it's not as complicated as last Sunday. Trinity Sunday is a, an important thing, especially if you're able to spiritually discern the reason why it's so important. The way in which God works toward his people and through his people. The one who made us, the one who redeemed us, and the one who leads us. But this one is about justification of faith. What happens when we put our trust in God, when we extend our mind and our heart into the unknown of the will of God and to do so with confidence and obedience and hope? What is it when we put our trust in God? What is faith? And what is this claim that Paul so clearly makes in chapter 5 and then again in chapter 8 to be justified by faith? So I want us to think clearly about that and I, I want us to be faithful to the text and I want us to be faithful to our own testimony. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground and said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you've come such a distance to the home of this servant. So they said, Well, then do as you have said, and Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah. And he said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. And then he took curds and the milk and the calf that he had prepared, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. <coughs> they said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. And then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah both were old, advanced in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself and said, After I've grown old and my husband is old, then I would have such a blessing. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall indeed I bear a child at this time, now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? 
At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied and said, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. Then the men set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. I like the fact that the one who gave the promise, who spoke the prophecy, who was justly treated in the custom of hospitality in the time of Abraham, who unknown to them was divine, that these three men appeared and they were treated with kindness and were taken care of. And they gave a promise, a wonderful promise. And Sarah thought it was impossible because, after all, some things are just too good to be true. And they said, wonder why she laughed. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? I will return in due season. And when I return, Sarah, you shall have a son. And the only response she had was so very much like most of us, certainly me. Sarah denied and said, I did not laugh because she was afraid. I understand that. But it's the response. It's the response that should give us all some hope. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. One of the things that needs to be a component part of your faith is to realize who is the one offering such gifts and how should one comport oneself? How should you live and speak and trust and in what manner shall you act in light of such a powerful presence and such a wonderful promise? The promise for us, of course, being life eternal, blessing, redemption, salvation, that's a central part of what it means to be a human being, to know that we are indeed creatures, but that we are eternal creatures, not our flesh and blood bodies, but our spirit, our soul. I realize that there are people who deal with the semantics of, is the spirit one thing and the soul another? I'm not that educated, so I can't really make the distinction. I know that there's a part of me, inside of me, this thing that yearns and laughs and weeps, this thing that sometimes even brings compassion forth from inside myself. For other people, the desire to be kind to the stranger or to be attentive to a friend. Do I always get to do that? No. No, there are times when I've let my friends down and there are times when I've doubted rather than believed. In times when I've been despondent rather than confident or courageous. And if I were to say, Lord, you know, I, I did the best I could, the Lord would speak to my heart and say what the Lord says still. Oh, no, you did not do the best you could. I didn't laugh. Oh, yes, you did laugh. It wasn't, oh, yes, you did laugh, laugh and now I'll take away your blessing. Or, oh, yes, you did laugh, and since you told a fib on top of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you endure a plague. No, he said, oh, yes, you did laugh. He knows us. So then this component of Christian faith that we have today, not unlike Sarah's, will be a challenge because we are afraid. We are skeptical. <laughs> we are doubtful many times and we're timid and we're justified by our faith interesting I mean if we were justified by works well we still couldn't make it but if we were justified by works we'd at least think we have a fighting chance but by our faith our faith is small 
Fortunately, Jesus told us that just a little mustard seed of faith goes a long, long way in the heart of God. Now let's go to a more colorful character than Sarah. Sarah was right good girl. King David. I didn't realize till I went to seminary just exactly how much of a scoundrel King David could be. And from the time I was nine or 10 years old, Psalm 116 has been my favorite psalm. I like it. We had these American Bible Society, New Testament and Psalms that someone bought for the church when I was a little boy and great big print. And of course it was King James. And, and so I, I, I learned on King James and we would all read a Bible verse at prayer meeting every Wednesday night and we could read along in, in the print and it was very good print. And I think the American Bible Society still sells those New Testament and Psalms. But many times I would take a piece from Psalm 116. It's a thanksgiving, a thanksgiving for recovery from a time of illness or trial. So after one of whatever scrape he was in, David wrote this according to the Jewish tradition. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications, because he's inclined his ear to me, and therefore I will call on him as long as I live. That's a big promise. That's a lot to chew on, especially when we think about the difficulties we have in this world right now with the coronavirus. It's true. We're going to be dealing with this monster for a while. It's got power, but it's temporary. We, <coughs> we have to be patient and good and trusting with each other, and we have to be tenacious about this disease so that we won't kill each other. But as bad as it is, it's not the worst plague that's ever been, and it probably will, as others have done, pass away. But this is a word from someone who said, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. And there was a fellow who was on the respirator for 21 days. This has been last month. And they were interviewing him. And in the interview, he began to cry. And he said, I don't deserve this. Which is another component of this faith, which is the means by which God allows us to be justified. I don't deserve this. There's a point in time when we realize that the goodness of God as God himself is, the goodness of God is large. The goodness of God is expansive in its height and its depth and its breadth and all other dimensions. And for some reason, the goodness of this God surpasses our deserving. Not only is our faith a timid faith, which often fails us because of our humanity, but it's also true that the Lord's love for us is pleased with the faith that we offer. Now, do we want our faith to be stronger? Absolutely. Should we pray for our faith to increase? Certainly. But this faith, as big as it may ever get to be with you and with me, this faith is, well, it's... Uh, doesn't seem like much. It's one of the weakest aspects of our being. Now, yes, there are some exceptions. I was raised in a little town with a lot of old women who lived a life of faith to such a degree that they are, for me, the angels of my time. And I love them. And they're all present with the Lord, and I know that. My faith may be little, but it's not non-existent. And their words and their tenderness and their kindness toward me when I was a little boy, when I was a young man, 
and every time I saw them, I was blessed. Miss Virginia Young, my first grade teacher, is also my great grandmother's sister in law. And when I went to school to Emory and Henry, the first thing that she said to me when she heard I was going to school, she said, Don't forget that you have to say your prayers. Well, I was meaner than Garbroth by the time I was 18 years old. She knew that, wasn't a secret. I had a Camaro. I was skinny, good looking, so they say, or at least to my face. Remember that you st still have to say your prayers. During that time in my life, I did have to learn how to say my prayers. And I'm glad. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplication, even when my soul cried out and my stubborn mind resisted. I love the Lord because he's inclined his ear to me even when I was silent and he heard the, the, the thoughts and intents of my heart. I was surrounded by the snares of death and the very pain of hell had laid hold on me and I suffered distress and anguish and I did. But I called upon the name of the Lord in that time not when it was a pretty Sunday Easter morning and everybody's got dressed up and no, no, no. In my distress and anguish in the midst of the life I had led that brought me to such disrepair and to such weakened faith and to such disobedience at that time surrounded by the snares of hell, I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple, obviously, or I'd be dead. When I was brought low, he saved me. So return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. So here we have this faith, somewhat timid and often abandoned, and still God hears our voice and gives ear to our thoughts and deals bountifully with us. So faith is not just a recognition of the goodness of God and the power of God and the sovereignty of God. It's all those things, certainly. We learn that early. It's easy for us to understand. God is all these things, all powerful, all knowing, but all merciful. Where would I be without the Lord? I shudder to think. Lord, thou hast indeed delivered my soul from death and my, my eyes from tears and my feet from stumbling. And I walk before the land. I walk before thee, O Lord, in the land of the living. And I've kept my faith even when I said I'm greatly afflicted. And I said in my consternation, everyone has lied to me. So how can I return an offering to the Lord for such this for such this bounty to me. Well, this is what I'll do. I'll lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people. For precious in the sight of the Lord even is the death of his faithful ones. In other words, from the time we are conceived, yes, from the time we are conceived, from the time we're born, from the time we learn to walk or talk, from the time we scrape our knee for the first time, from the time we've had our first girlfriend or boyfriend, from the time we have to go home, go away, uh, rather away from home for the first time, for the time that we have to embark on marriage and try to come to terms with such an enormous responsibility one that we have no idea what we're hearing. How in the world can I return to the Lord? What kind of offering or praise? What kind of goodness? What kind of, 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 of honor should I give to the Lord for such bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. In other words, 
If there is salvation, it alone comes from God. If there's strength, it alone comes from God. If there's mercy, it alone comes from God. And I'll pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Did you know Methodists, this is a side comment, it distresses me. My CPA told me that Methodists are the, give the least amount of money in their offerings than any other denomination. Any other, I'm sure there's some little denomination somewhere, but any other regular denomination. We give the least. We have larger churches, and when I serve larger churches, fund campaign drives in the fall for people to give their pledges. Now, in comparison to the Presbyterians, who simply get up on Sundays, the preacher does, and says, okay, now next Sunday we turn in our pledge cards. Don't forget, if you don't come to church, mail them in. And that's that. Or the Lutherans, who absolutely tithe. It's madness. One fellow whose life I will never forget and whose goodness is of, in a, impossible to, uh, to, 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 to lose sight of I had a lot of responsibility. He was a good man and a hard worker. And he was uh, funny. His favorite uh, music was Bach. He was a heck of a chess player. And I sat next to him while I was in college in church on Sundays. And um, the time came for the offering and he would always pull out his checkbook and write his, his tithe check. How can I turn my heart to God? How can I speak or act or feel or hope or obey a God whose bounty to me is immeasurable? What on earth can I offer the Lord as thanks and praise? The testimony that my salvation is secure in his perfect will through Christ. And my vow to the Lord now is to say, Lord, I want to journey with you and do the best I can. Now, I mentioned that thing about in the Catholic lectionary, in the Catholic year, this is that uh, Sunday where they celebrate the sacred and solemn, sacred solemnity of the, of the Mass, the Lord's Supper. And I'm sure that some of you went, well, I don't care about them old Catholics and that old Lord's Supper. Well, don't worry about it. It's a good thing. And you know that when you take the Lord's Supper, even if it's once a year. But what it means is, I've come before you, Lord, to receive this gift of Christ that he's commanded us to take. And I don't deserve to come forward. And I'm unworthy to receive it. <laughs> And my life is not a reflection of great obedience. And my life has lots of evidence of timidity and faith. But I want to continue to walk in the name of God, to pray in the name of God, to love in the name of God, to hope in the name of God. These two are components of our faith. I remember that precious in your sight, O oh Lord, is for little babies that are newborn, young people that are newly wed, young parents who have their first child, mothers and fathers who see their first child go off to be married, parents who grow old and retire, parents who are in the last throes of breath on their, on their deathbed. Precious to God are each of us in all those things, in all those times. And to acknowledge and testify to that truth is a part of our faith. So we can say, yeah, our faith is weak and our faith is timid. And we're long on bragging and short on doing. And the Lord knows when we laugh when we shouldn't. And the Lord knows when we fail and claim that we just tried our best and couldn't do better. And the Lord said, oh, yes, you did laugh. 
Oh, no, you didn't try hard enough. You're still mine. To give that testimony. This is the offering I give to God. This is the God who loves me in all my shortcomings and calls me to be better by the work of his spirit that sanctifies my soul through the mystery of the victory of Christ. So the psalmist finishes by saying this, O Lord, I am your servant, not the best one, nothing famous. I'm your servant, the child of your servant girl, and you have loosed my bonds. And I will offer you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on your holy name and pay my vows to you in front of all those whom I love in the courts of the house of Jacob and all those who believe with me. In the midst of those who gather in Jerusalem, I will stand for thee. Oh, praise the Lord. Now you don't have to get scared because the sermon is interlaced with the reading. So no, there won't be a two hour sermon to follow this. But before we read the gospel, we'll read from Romans chapter five. It's simple, it's easy, it's good. Let's see, what else? Is Romans in the New Testament? I think it is. Why, yes. <coughs> Voila. Now here is this fantastic Jewish rabbi, member of the Sanhedrin, schooled under Gamaliel, he knows the law. He knows the prophets. He knows the customs and the practices of worship. He, he was passionate about Judaism and its place in the world. He knew that Judaism would be the crowning glory of God's will revealed when the Messiah comes. And then he spent his life, or was planning to spend his life, killing Christians. Now I know how he feels. And God changes his life. And all of a sudden, the justification that he'd looked for all his life, the justification by obedience to the law, the observance to the traditions of the teachings and the prophets, submission to the wisdom in the literature of Proverbs and even Psalms, making sure he prayed no less than five times a day and always, in every instance, prayed with clean hands, who observed all of the laws concerning what kinds of food to eat and what kinds of food to avoid, who was a man of honor and morality and could claim all kinds of righteousness. He talks in Philippians that he looks back on that part of his life and counts all that as refuse in favor of trusting and loving and following Christ. His name is Paul. This is what he says to the Roman church. The church at Rome who's under persecution that just about looks like it's going to be the end of Christianity. And they're desperate and they're scared and their faith is timid and they haven't done all they could do, but they've tried and failed and we're facing the destruction and certainty of death just for believing in Christ and loving Christ and worshiping together and practicing their faith. <coughs> They're scared. And he should have wrote them a, courage, a courageous letter that says, well, you know, just st stiff up her lip. Hold on. Or if you pray hard enough, the Lord will deliver you. No. Submit yourself to the Lord, like in Psalm 116. Make your presence known, whether you're in Jerusalem or with your friends or just among your family, or if it's just you and the Lord. Present yourself to the Lord in faith. Don't come with a bunch of lists of bragging things. No. Just go with your faith. That little tiny thing that Jesus often referred to as a mustard seed. That little piece of us that hopes beyond hope and trusts without any strong evidence 
in a promise that cannot be denied by the resurrection the authority of God made flesh, the victory of God over death, the mercy of God from the cross and its blood. Paul changed all of his I'm so good that I can't stand it to this statement. Chapter 5, verse 1 in Romans. Therefore, since we're justified by faith, we now have peace. A peace with God that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's through him that we've obtained access to this grace, the grace in which we stand. You know, forgiveness without deserving it, eternal life without earning it, that which came into being when we were conceived and after we were born and when we took our first breath, that moment which was as precious to God at the beginning as it would be at the end, this grace we stand in, this thing that God has given us to fulfill God's own personal will for us, his people, his children. We've obtained access to this grace by faith. All we had to do was trust a little bit in a love that is immeasurable. And not only that, but we also boast even when we suffer, knowing that when we suffer, endurance is born, and from endurance comes character, and character brings hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the power and presence and work of the Spirit which has been given to us. You see, even in our quiet moment, in the middle of the dark, in the middle of the night, when we're worried the most and we're all alone, we're never alone. <coughs> because right down deep inside us, in a place that I cannot locate, nor would, nor would I try, it's not just us, it's the Spirit of God in us that sustains us in our lowest points, forgives us in our worst sin, convicts us and, and causes us to turn to the Lord and ask to be redeemed and made whole and to be moved toward the image of Christ and to live and to walk in the being of Christ and to hope and to live in the promise of Christ. For while we were still weak, as if we're strong, while we were very weak, at the very right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath that God has in store for the wicked. This comes through the death of his son, and then much more surely, having been reconciled through this death, we will be saved by his life. And even more than that, we can even boast in God through Christ that we are his children. For it's in Christ and in him alone that we have now received this reconciliation, this truth, this status, this grace, this new being that the Holy Spirit ratifies in our heart. You can't learn it. You can't earn it. And praise God, you can't burn it. There is this thing in us, this spirit, that moves with us and bears witness to us and grieves with us and yearns for us to keep our hearts turned toward God and, and convicts us of sin and convinces us of grace and calls us to the Father through Christ and in Christ's name. So you can say, well, preacher, I've been wicked. Well, so have I. No, preacher, I hated people. So have I. Preacher, I've been so mad I wanted to kill somebody. So have I. Preacher, I killed somebody. Well, I'm not telling Oh, I haven't done that, but I've hated people enough to at times. When I was a sinner, when I ran from God after being raised in the very bosom of the church, 
when there was a time in college when I thought, God, I wish I could pray to you like I used to pray when I was a child. I still wish that. I had such confidence then. And it wasn't until I had children and then grandchildren that I understood I was beginning to learn once again how to pray like a child. Total confidence in the one who loves me, without a doubt. Yep, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son Jesus. And if this is good, how much more good is this next thing? We've been reconciled and saved, not just by the death on his cross, but by the resurrection at his tomb. And even more so, we can now even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for it's in him that we have now received this reconciliation. This is another reason why I so, so often want to stress there are th so many things we have in common with each other as Christians. You know, we Protestants, we all have our theories. You know, we believe either pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. And if you don't believe in mid-trib, but you believe in post-trib, you're not saved. And because I believe in pre-trib. And if you're pre-trib and I'm mid-trib, you can't go to heaven. And you know, all that stuff. Uh, that's silliness. I don't care when it comes. I don't care how he comes. I don't care when he comes. I'm just hoping that he comes to the body of Christ, to the world which he's redeemed at the appointed time when God will send him, accompanied by angels, surrounded by all the witnesses of God for us. All that show is for us. So don't let any preacher, me included, scare you to death with the boogeyman because the boogeyman's out of business when it comes to some little timid faith. Just a little timid faith. We are justified, not by our greatness. We're justified in our weakness. That's how much God loves us. I know what you want to say. You want to go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but nothing. Every day you'll need to ask for forgiveness. Every day. Sorry, because we're scoundrels. We don't want to be, well, most of the time. You know, we may get up with our friends and go to Johnson City and be scoundrels, but the next day we'll pretend like we've never even been to Johnson City. There's a call on your life now. See, that's the part of faith and redemption and salvation and justification that I've saved the best for last. Don't be stingy with this gift that you have received. Don't be smug about being saved by grace. For brothers and sisters, we are saved by the grace of God, not our own. We are saved in a way that separates us from our failures, though we deserve to wallow in them. We're saved by a loving God who can look at us in our worst time and say, oh, yes, you did laugh. Oh, no, you didn't try hard enough. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, chapter 9, verse 35 in Matthew and following. He went about all the cities and villages, by the way, some of them weren't Jewish. Some of them were even Samaritan villages, which is worse than just being goyim. You know, you it's one thing to, to be non-Jewish, to be some Gentile, that's bad. But to be a wannabe Jew, those, those cousins that went off in captivity to Assyria and returned without any semblance of identity with tradition or the teachings or worship, who wanted to be Jews but were never accepted. Jesus went about every village, Samaritan, Gentile, Jewish, where there were good people and bad people and mean people. 
and sick people and weary people and people who were afraid and poor people. He went to every section of New York City, every section of the furthest reaches in the Blue Ridge Mountains, every desert, every island, every place in this world. He went about the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news of this kingdom he promised, curing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the people crowded together, he was filled with compassion. How in the world do I repay a word of thanksgiving to the Lord for the bounty of his mercy toward me? He had compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, this harvest is plentiful. There's a lot to pick here, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest of his. Little church is a small church. They almost closed us. We were about to die as if you could kill a church. I thought we were done for. I thought, well, the church has given up on us. The conference is going to shut us down. We'll have to find some other place to worship. Them old people at that old conference... And it was like every other thing with me. It, le it looks so bleak and impossible that I drive by the church and I think, I just have retired and I've just moved back to Linville. And Lord have mercy, they're going to close the church. What a shame. What can I do? And I talked to the DS and he didn't seem like he had much hope. And, and it looked awful. And I thought, oh, that's terrible. What should I do? Well... I have to do like Thomas Webb and make phone calls and like my daughter, call a bishop that's retired that likes her a lot. Get them to call and talk to our bishop and say, go ahead, give them a shot. We say, well, we'll get David Hobson said he'll preach. Who's he? He's Frida's husband. Oh, and they'll say, well, we know Frida. Boy, you talk about making me mad. The harvest is plentiful. But even if you're a little bitty church that almost died, that got so low and so disappointed and so scared that there are just a few people left and we didn't look like we could do anything, go before the Lord and say, Lord, we're here. You're the Lord of the harvest. Make us one of yours. When he finished saying these things, he summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. What? These guys, they can't figure out a parable. They can't understand a miracle. They don't know where he's going half the time. They're bewildered because he goes to Samaritans and he goes to Tiberias, to those Gentiles. <coughs> they can't figure out why he would heal a bad person as quickly as he would a, a good person. They, they don't know what, and he picks them well, listen, if you look at the lives of the disciples and the questions they asked and the frustrations they felt in the stories of the gospel, you'll know that, well, heck, you can be one too. Because what Jesus is looking for is a little bit of faith. His justifying grace, his justifying power can change death to life and timidity to courage and inability and incapacity to ability and gift and hopelessness to the courageous proclamation of the truth that Jesus is Lord. So he gave them over authority of unclean spirits. That's through the Holy Spirit, of course. To cast out devils and to cure diseases of every kind. And these are their names. Simon, who couldn't catch a fish, known as Peter, his brother Andrew, who was as humble and good as they come. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who weren't too particularly fond of fishing, and they worked alongside Simon. Philip and Bartholomew. Bartholomew, he had his own problems. 
Philip was as good as Andrew. Those two boys listened to every word John the Baptist said until John sent them off to follow Jesus. Thomas, the man who doubted a lot. Matthew, the guy who sold out the Jews to be a tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. What kind of crowd was Jesus doing this with? What, what kind of idea did Jesus have? Can God take that which is his and turn it into what he hopes for and wants? Can God take something ordinary and make it extraordinary? Can God take something like Linville United Methodist Church and turn it into a bastion of faith? Yep. Can he turn the love we have for each other? And by the way, that's one of the greatest gifts I've ever seen in my life is the way we love each other. Can he take that little tiny gift and open its doors and say to people, hey, if you don't have a church, come on in. We have a great time. If you don't believe it, come to Bible study. We're all a bunch of monkeys in the zoo at Bible study. We love the Lord because he's heard our voice and our supplication, and therefore we'll call upon his name as long as we shall live. Jesus sent these twelve out with these instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Is that not wild? He goes all over the place to everybody. He says, you guys just stick to the Jews. That's enough work for you right now. And as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. It's kind of like what bishops will say to you when you go to your first church after you've decided to announce your call and they examine you and give you a license to preach and set you out on your way. Go out there and do all these miracles and you're thinking, I'm not even sure I'll be able to learn how to preach. I just barely know how to pray and I pray poorly. I'm not sure what I can do and I'm not sure how I'm going to make this and I'm going to be scared to death for the first 18 months. <coughs> about, that, about that time. Until the courage begins to build in my soul by the Spirit and what has been up to that point a disaster in the pulpit began to make a little sense. Go proclaiming without a doubt that the kingdom has come near and take your gifts and cure the sick and take your gifts and raise the dead and take your gifts and cleanse the lepers and take your gifts and cast out devils. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, no two tunics or sandals, nor a staff. For laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it's not worthy, let your peace return back to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet as you leave town. But keep walking. Just because somebody doesn't like the preacher. Just, some, just because somebody doesn't like our, our doctrine or our way of worship. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Reach, touch, invite, love. And if it's received, rejoice. And if it's returned, rebuffed to you, carry that treasure and offer it to yet another person. I send you like sheep to the midst of wolves. So be wise as a serpent and innocent as doves. Let God richly bless the reading and hearing of his word. We're justified by a very timid, limited, human thing called faith. Not justified in a partial way or lit in by the skin of our teeth, but justified by the broad, all-encompassing power and love and forgiveness and purpose and joy of God. 
Our Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and ask to increase our faith indeed and to give us courage to offer our gifts to your purposes and to live in obedience to your call and to live in love with one another. We ask you to keep us certain that you watch over our children and grandchildren and when they're sick or in danger that you are always there to comfort us in the knowledge that in the suddenness of death for one who is young or old you rejoice in the goodness of your saints even in their death you love them and they belong to you that you're as joyful in our life at its end as you were at its beginning and that the holiness of your love is revealed in the teaching of your Son, in the victory over death, and in the power of the Spirit which you and the, the Son sent together into our hearts. Let that Spirit grow in us, move in us, give us confidence and fill us with love, that we may be the person who is the answer to someone's need by the testimony of our faith in Jesus Christ who taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. God bless you.